Welcome to Clover, Virginia, home to around 536 people and home of the subject that we are going to talk about today on our virtual field trip. As we make our way into the woods, you see a formerly enslaved cabin. This is where our subject grew up, overlooking the grave of her mother. Many of her relatives, including herself, her daughter, and her mother are buried here. Please observe a moment of silence for Henrietta Lacks. Hi, it's me, Miss Shea, the Traveling Teach, and I'm coming to you today from Clover, Virginia. I'm coming to you from the grave of a woman named Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was born in 1920. She was the ninth of 10 children, and her mother died in 1924, giving birth to her 10th child. Henrietta's family had way too many children for one father to take care of, and so they were spread out, and Henrietta ended up here in Clover, Virginia, living with a grandfather. Living there as well was her cousin David, known as Day. Henrietta was four, Day was nine years old. The Lax family here in Clover, um, particularly her grandfather, lived on a plantation that their family had been working since enslaved times, and so she grew up living in a former enslaved cabin. By the age of 14, she had her first child with her cousin Day. That child's name was Lawrence. She went on to have four more children. Um, her son Lawrence, then a daughter Elsie, another son called Sonny, another daughter named Deborah, known as Dale, and then a fifth and final son named Joe, who changes his name to Zechariah in his adulthood. Now, one of the tragic things is that Henrietta could look out from the slave cabin that she was growing up in to see the grave of her mother. Henrietta's life um, is a full and rich story that is told by Rebecca Skloot in her book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. If you've never heard of the name Henrietta Lacks before, you may have heard of the Gila cell line, H-E-L-A for Henrietta Lacks. You may have heard that name said differently as Helen Lane or Harriet Lakes. This was an effort at privacy, but also an effort to keep her family from knowing what was done with her cells. But we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. Henrietta Lacks' daughter, Elsie, as she was known, had epilepsy and was known to have intellectual disabilities. Henrietta sent her to a facility for those with intellectual disabilities, which was common practice at the time, although it's not entirely known her reasons, whether or not it's simply because it was common practice or whether or not it's because she had smaller children to take care of and so caring for an intellectually disabled child was too much. Either way, Elsie went to live at a facility and Henrietta actually went to visit her every week until she was too sick to do so. It's later found out that Elsie was probably experimented on, as were many children there during that time, and Elsie died at the age of 15 at that facility. She's buried here, next to her mother. So let's talk about the life of Henrietta Lacks. After World War II, her husband gets a job in Baltimore. And so as part of the Great Migration, um, he moves north into Baltimore from Clover, Virginia, and she follows a year later with their two small children. They live in the Turner Station area of Baltimore, and Henrietta's life, by all accounts, is a good one. Uh, she has a husband, she has children, she drinks occasionally and sneaks out to dance with the girls. But overall, she's dedicated to her children and has a good life there. In her late 20s, she identifies what she says is a knot on her womb. And this small lump causes her a little bit of concern. And she talks to her girlfriends about it, who are also her cousins. And they're like, it's probably a pregnancy on the outside of the womb, an ectopic pregnancy. And she's like, no, this feels different. She ends up getting pregnant with her fifth and final child, Joe. And so her family's like, see, we told you, pregnancy, no big deal. She says, no, this is definitely something different. And so eventually she goes to her doctor 
and uh, her doctor sends her on to Johns Hopkins University. Now, Johns Hopkins is the only hospital in the area that is treating people of color at this time. It's also a teaching hospital and a charitable hospital, and so they do um, free services for people of color and for those who are economically disadvantaged at the time. The one thing they don't really share is that the idea, although it may not be said explicitly, is that if you're coming here for free care, then we get to use you and your body and your cells and your medical stories for research and education. Nowadays, you can't do that. Nowadays, you have to tell people that you're doing those things. But back then, this, this wasn't something that, that happened. And so she goes to the hospital and they run some tests thinking that it's just syphilis. And they do find out that she has asymptomatic syphilis. Um, her husband was promiscuous. And so she also ends up eventually with gonorrhea as well from his dalliances. But they also find cervical cancer. And at first it's deemed that the cervical cancer is stage one and it should be relatively treatable. Uh, it also happens that there's a lot of research at this time going on, not only into cervical cancer, um, but also into the polio vaccine. And, and that's gonna come into play just a little bit later. So Henrietta is told that she does have cancer and that she needs to come in for radium treatments. So radium is a radioactive element. You might recognize it if you've heard of the name Marie Curie before. And so radium is put into Henrietta Lacks's body. They insert it into her body and lean it up against the cancerous tumor. They find that the cancerous tumor gets smaller and so they feel like this is turning out to be successful. They then move on to do x-ray treatments. Meanwhile, Henrietta is still taking care of her children. She's still going about her business. She hasn't really told anyone, but then she needs more consistent treatments. And so she tells her cousins um, and they finally use the C word, cancer. And so she has to go every day for a month and be picked up and dropped off for these treatments. These treatments are actually blackening the outside of her body, from her breast down to her pelvis, because essentially she's burning up from within from all of the radiation that's in her body. Unfortunately, her cancer is also really aggressive. And so she goes back for treatment and they're like, she's fine, she's fine, checkups, fine. And then one visit comes and they say, no, you have cancer and it's terminal. She ends up staying at the hospital, seeing her children upset her so much that the nurses ask that Day doesn't bring the children to come and see her anymore. So then she has to watch her children play at the hospital outside the window until she's too weak to be able to look at them outside the window. Henrietta Lacks dies on October 4th, 1951. They ask her husband to agree to an autopsy and He's skeptical and they're like, well, your children, you know, we want to make sure this isn't something that can harm your children. So he agrees to a partial autopsy, which limits the amount of things that they're able to do. They open Henrietta up and they say it's described as her body looks like it's covered in pearls. This cancer is everywhere. And so they then have started to realize that this is something really special. They actually started to realize it while Henrietta Lacks was alive. Because what they haven't told Henrietta or her family is that in her initial tests and biopsies, they collected some cells. And they had found that these cells were able to stay alive. Up until this point, they had only been able to keep cells alive outside the body for an extended period of time in mice. They want this for human trials, but they haven't been able to find anyone. Henrietta Lacks's cells turn out to be cells that are considered immortal. They are fast growing, they grow well under culture, they stay, they're diverse and able to be used for a lot of different things. But her family is never told that part of her was taken without her consent and without theirs. Even after she dies, they continue to harvest tissues and cells 
from Henrietta's body, despite the fact that her husband signed that limited autopsy release. The Lax family doesn't even find out about the HeLa cell line until the 1970s. And this by accident. It turns out that a family member marries someone who's in cancer research and puts together the name Lax with Henrietta Lax and asks some questions, and they find out that this line of cells is still ongoing from when Henrietta Lax was alive. It's devastating to her family and to her children, and particularly to the members of her family who don't have higher education and so don't necessarily understand all of the implications. At first, there's some confusion. Is Henrietta still alive? What does this mean? Um, what they try to explain to them that this is just the cell line. Um, and what they're still not explaining is the amount of financial gain that came from the HeLa cell line from Henrietta Lacks. There are incredible medical advances that are a result of the HeLa line, including the polio vaccine and other treatments for cancers, finding out more about um, cells and how they live and how they reproduce. It also is responsible for helping unlock the number of DNA strands in DNA, which then helps unlock the secrets to Down syndrome, to finding out that there are more chromosomes in someone with Down syndrome than without. Um, and so all of these amazing medical advances are thanks to the life of Henrietta Lacks. But more than that, there is a huge financial gain. At the time of this video, a vial of HeLa cells can be purchased for $630. Now, HeLa cells are used everywhere for everything. We're talking millions and even billions of dollars that have come from this. And her own children weren't able to get free medical health care or any kind of reparation or financial restitution for not only the life of Henrietta Lacks, but the gross misuse by the medical community and the way in which the medical community didn't even tell them the things that they needed to know. Like there are consent issues here, there are privacy issues here, there are all kinds of things, not only with Henrietta herself, but with her family and her children and their ongoing descendants. But I wanted to tell you about the life of Henrietta Lacks here at her resting place. I want you to know about her as a beautiful, vibrant black woman who all she wanted to do was take care of her children and who died at the age of 31 because of fear of medicine, misunderstanding of medicine, and direct abuse by the medical community and the privacy issues that are there with that and the consent issues that are there with that. And to the point where even while she was alive, they were starting to make television appearances to talk about immortal cells and these amazing cell lines. And the medical malpractice doesn't stop with Henrietta Lacks and her family. Um, there is a doctor who decided to inject her cells, the HeLa cells, into other people. At first, those with cancer to see what would happen, although they were being told they were part of cancer research and treatment. Then into healthy men, at an Ohio penitentiary. Now, for some of them, they said, I've done some really bad things, and so the opportunity to help and learn more about this for science might be some way for me to do something good. So then they realized, well, maybe we should tell people <laughs> what we're doing, because maybe people will say yes. And so they continued to inject these cancerous cells into healthy and cancer-ridden patients to see what would happen, to be able to test that. This is not the first time that we see people of color being mistreated by the medical community. This brings up, obviously, thoughts of the Tuskegee experiments, where uh, men who had syphilis are observed. And even though it's known at that time that penicillin can cure syphilis, they are being told that they are being treated when in actuality, doctors are simply studying the effects of syphilis on the body. They're not curing those men. 
they are actively watching them die so that they can gather scientific information. So this is the story of Henrietta Lacks and her family. I hope that you've learned something new today. I strongly encourage you to read the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot, and learn all that you can about this woman who was just an ordinary woman whose cells become extraordinary and her story becomes infamous, making her immortal. <laughs>